let's get it started, folks. I hope you have your coffee by your side. Get it all started. Have a friend that you've invited into the room. And if you do, say it in the chat. We'd love to hear from you. So welcome from Nova, uh, Network Nova Live. It's March 1st, 2024, and you are on the Friday Power Lunch. I'm Catherine White, your host, bringing you the guests, the issues, the action. We fuel the grassroots from Virginia and coast to coast. We get things got done. Together, we're stronger and smarter, and we make politics fun. So let's get perked up. I'm so excited. I think we're on episode nine today, and I can't believe that. We've already come out of our new year, episode nine, and as we said before, we're going national. Every last Friday of the month, we do a national program, and that is going to be so super to add to our room. And this today's episode is called We Are the Messengers from Local News to National Politics. We know the grass grassroots is the best line of defense against all the disinformation campaigns. So we are so grateful. Let's get to our guests and say hello to them. And because it's women's history, let's give a big wave to Elizabeth Griffith historian, activist, and author of In Her Own Right, The Life of Elizabeth Candy Statton and Formidable American Women and the Fight for Equality. And now she has been authoring The Pink Threads. If you've been following, let's put that link in the chat for people to take a look at. And then next up, friend of the Friday Power Lunch is our wonderful democratic messaging expert, Antonia Scatton. Give a wave, Antonia. It's always great to see you in the room. And when we talk about the ink and the news and the local news, we have with us Kate Bassett. So great she's in the room, political director, Courier Newsroom. And uh, she's a strategist with, strategist with over 20 years of experience in the intersection of civic media, politics, and community building. And let's give her a big hand to be on the Friday Power Lunch. Welcome, Kate. And lastly, we'll have Jerry Conley here, our congressman in CD11 in Virginia. And he just returned from NATO and he's going to give us some updates. If you've been watching some of the Ukraine footage and also national footage, um, we need to see what Jerry's mind is, what's going on today in the House. Let's see what Mike Johnson's up to. I mean, are we passing a budget? Hello. All right. Let's get to some show, show business, the rules of the road. You know the room. Use the chat. Tell us where you're from. Make sure you're friendly. Make sure that if you get nasty, you know, we'll kick you out. So just keep it cool. And then the after chat, we're so excited. And this is where we build community after one o'clock. And Elizabeth Griffith will be able to stay here for at least 20 more minutes if you have questions to ask her. And some of our other guests will be able to stay. So make sure that you get comfortable, get your coffee, get your favorite beverage, and make sure you're going to stay till at least 1.30. And our newest Patreons, our supporters, Sharon White. Hey, I wonder if she's a sister, Sharon White. I'm not sure. I have to find out. Sybil Burgess and Danielle Sawyer. And Danielle and I spent some uh, time together at the Chinese New Year. Great to see her and great for that support. And again, no one is coming to save us, folks. It is up to us. And speaking of that, speaking of this whole Virginia news that we haven't had our wonderful grassroots, grassroots fearless leader, Lu Luisa Borowski, if we could spotlight her and bring her up. I have missed you. I Look at that's a new background. Are you doing the General Assembly? I oh. am. I'm at the office today, uh, but yes. I've been doing a lot of standing desk recently and it's weird. I'm actually sitting right now, but I put up a background just to be to be festive for the I new season that we have already budding in in uh, Virginia, which is crazy. Yeah, I, I'm going to let you just go at it. Let's dish about this session and uh, get. I, I mean, really, it's. I'm so glad to have you back. So much has been going on. So go for it. So much has been going on. Well, in Richmond, I will say, the grassroots has really, really made sure that our voice was heard this year. Um, I want first thank you all to for doing the calls to action. They've made such a huge difference. Just going to different offices and seeing the tallies on the walls that legislators have that say, hey, I've heard from this many constituents. This is how they want me to vote on this bill has been really, really impactful. Um, we already have 37 of our priority bills have passed both the House and Senate. So I think that says to us, you know, and a lot of those were, you know, we're not just bills that everybody was, you know, expecting to to go through. So again, those calls to action made a huge difference, but we still have 23 bills that are still being considered and need your support. We've got until March 9th to get them all over the finish line. And so you will still see calls to action from me and from Stair. And so please, please take those. They 
again, we found them to be particularly successful this year. Some of the areas we are seeing some good success are our education bills. They are passing and a lot of them are passing with bipartisan support, which is fantastic news. Um, some of the big ones are increases to teacher salaries and also um, bills that give local uh, localities greater flexibility to improve school funding. So these are gonna be really important for resourcing our public schools going forward. And with bipartisan support, we're really hopeful that that means these bills um, will be signed into law and also included in the budget this year. We have also seen some good progress in good governance. We are still trying to get our uh, removal reform bill over the finish line. It is currently in the Senate and might be going back over to the House for final approval because there have been a couple of amendments, but we're really excited. This is a bill that was spearheaded by the Virginia Grassroots Coalition. We started working on this um, with local Commonwealth attorneys and with school board members to say, hey, we don't want you to be attacked using a recall process that doesn't have any rules. And so we have tried to create more rules more standards that say you only get X amount of time to collect signatures, this can't go on forever, et cetera. We're super excited that it seems to have enough support to to go to finish up and get onto the governor's desk this year. This will be our third year working on that bill. And then another bill is improving access to electronic meetings. I don't know how many of you have served on a local um, body or board before, but there are some very strict rules about not being able to do much virtually. This expands virtual meeting um, access, which makes means meetings can be attended by lots more people who typically have trouble getting to places in person. So we're very excited about that. We've been working with um, patron Elizabeth Bennett Parker. She came to us for help on it uh, two years ago, and we're really glad to see that um, that looks like it's going to make it over the finish line as well. And we've got two really important bills um, under justice reform that still need a final push. One is the Fourth Amendment waiver. Um, and I will put more information and the link to in the chat so you can take action on that. Throughout Virginia, as many as 96% of people subject to the Fourth Amendment plea bargain waivers are Black and Brown um, citizens, and we want to make sure lawmakers are protecting their constituents from coercion to waive their constitutional rights. And so that's what that bill covers. And um, I'm also going to put some more information on another bill that we've been working on as well that could use some additional support. There are a couple of areas where we've had a lot of challenges this year, and it is something that we're noting that, you know, not every issue area is successful every year. Priorities are made by our legislators about what they want to push forward, how they think it's going to be helpful, um, you know, both in the current year, but also in upcoming election years. And so two of the areas that did not see a lot of good support and we will be continuing to work on are our clean energy and climate bills. Um, as well as our campaign finance reform bills. That being said, there's one more um, opportunity to try to get Virginia back into the Regional Greenhouse Gas Initiative. It's a call to action that was recently put together. So I'm going to put that in the chat. If you have time during this power lunch to take that action, we would really, really appreciate it. So again, please continue with those calls to action. We've got basically a week left. And um, the other thing is, if you want to learn more or go into more depth on some of these um, legislative topics, we are going to have our Virginia Grassroots Coalition meeting this Sunday, March 3rd at 6 p.m. So if you would like to join us, I will put my email in the chat and that will be your way to get the Zoom link. So it's so great to be back here. And, uh, you know, we're, yeah. chugging along. we're definitely chugging along. I know. And and again, I can't say enough about those calls to action either. When I went down there to lobby, everybody's talking about them because they need a, they have outdated systems. They can't handle like all those emails. So that I love that they know that people are paying attention. So thank you for that report out. Thank you for all you do, Louisa. It's awesome. Absolutely. Well, thank you guys. And it's so good to see you all in the Zoom. I know. I know you're so busy and I mean that in a good way. I mean, you're in elections, you're in voter stuff, you're everywhere and we so appreciate it. So thank you all. Yes, join our meetings folks, because this election, we need to stand up for Virginia. I just want to say about Super Tuesday, this is just so, I have you here, Louisa. Folks mm -hmm. in the room, if you have a chance, people could can go to the polling places on, on Tuesday and talk to voters, uh, volunteer that day. Isn't that a great opportunity to really kind of interface? It definitely is. And I was actually just in a meeting with uh, Dan Helmer's campaign and they're going to be doing an event. So I'll look up that link. But you know, it's a great opportunity to be yes. thinking about both the president, but others who are running this year, too. So 
the sooner we can get t- talking to voters and getting them excited about this whole election year, yes, um, all of the great Democratic candidates that we're going to have, um, the better. So, yes. Yeah. Get out there. Talk yeah, to get people. out there. It's already set up for you, folks. You don't have to do anything. Just go to the polls and talk to them. So thanks, Louisa. Thank you again. And let's pull up, uh, get up next, Vanel Norton. Let's do some power chat. We're a little bit behind already because <laughs> I just talked. Talk to me. <laughs> Here we go. Yes, uh, we, but it was really good stuff. So you were saying some really great things. And yeah. I I think it's, it's perfect for today women's history, but also with, we did receive some disappointing news uh, because of the right wing uh, in the Supreme Court. And I and I think that it's okay to have those feelings, yes. but we're here today so we can push them down because I think uh-huh. I've heard on TV so many times what you've said first and what I hear them saying is that the courts were never going to save us. It was always going to be up to us to save us. It's and so in true. order to do that, we have to be the messengers and we have to talk to people. And I think one of the important things that I walked away with yesterday that I will also, you'll hear uh, Antonia talk about today, it is us talking to our friends and our family and our neighbors that the time has gone when we say, well, we don't talk politics in my family, or we no. don't talk politics at the table, or we don't, the time has come for that to end. And so uh, there, we recognize that everybody does it in their own way. And that's why we have come up with another way to ease into the conversation so, um, the, Dennis, will you bring up the nuggets quickly? Yes. Look at the nuggets are at our ready. And I love the nuggets. And let's look at those. Look how beautiful they are. Okay, folks, what is a nugget? Is it a chicken nugget? Can you eat it? What is it? <laughs> it's, it's not a chicken nugget and you can't <laughs> eat it, but it's a little two and a half by two and a half size business card. And they're inspirational and they're funny. And they, so if you're in the grocery store or if you're at the drive through or if you're at a family event or if you're, you're at any event, you can choose the kind of nugget that you like, and then you can just sort of pass those off to people. One of the nuggets says, I hope something good happens for you today. And it's a really nice way to give someone a smile. And then on the back of it, it says something. It says, um, help someone that you love learn about the 2024 presidential election. And then it says, I will vote.com. And there's another nugget that has wonderful sayings on it. You can't see them very well here. We'll make sure that we put them in the chat for you. But there's one that's really funny. It says, there's an IQ test happening on November 5th, 2024. Will you pass? <laughs> and then on the back of the card, there's a picture of Kamala and Joe, Joe Biden and it, I will vote.com. So it's just a wonderful okay. way to give people information who may not be as comfortable talking, but you can certainly pass off a little nugget of inspiration or a little bit of wit and humor uh, to people that you meet. Yeah, and I love the nuggets, and you can order them, and the link is in the chat. Go and look at the the shop on Postcards for Virginia. Stair just got, Stair Calhoun, the big boss up there, uh, Ambassador of Bus, got her nuggets the other day. And uh, I remember back, I don't know if it was in 17 or 18, we made these little sticky pads, and they were all about voting, and we would just leave them everywhere, in the bathrooms, everywhere, and it was just another way to get out the message about the importance of the vote. I love the nugget. I think that's great. So so thank you for that nugget of information. Um, and if you're doing something cool to get the message out, uh, share other share in the chat. I know that Carrie Short is here from Cova Coalition, and she was just talking about their meeting last night was very successful. Uh, the other night was very successful, and they had people writing postcards already. So we have a couple of initiatives I'd like to say real quick is um, – the Marcus for Democracy are doing postcards to Biden to the White House because as Simon Rosenberg, that many of you may follow, has talked about today, it is about remaining, you know, as crappy and shitty sometimes as it feels that we stay in the 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 positive because the, you know, with we have to move on from what Trump or the MAGA wants us to focus to, focus on. They want us to just draw us into the drama. And, you know, this is the plan. So what we need to do is focus on the crimes that the, that the president has committed and just focus the spotlight back on them, because this is a strategic diversion, as Simon is saying. Don't be diverted, folks. Don't run to the shiny object. OK, yeah, that's Stick exactly up, right. Right. And, and part of what we'll learn today is, you know, we think we always think that messaging is very personal. I know. So when you're talking to your friends and your family and your acquaintances, that's more personal. So you should pick the issues that you know your family cares about, the issues that you know that you care about, and learn them. And and most of the time, you'll be asking why anyway. And then when it comes to that critical moment, when you need that little piece of information that sort of closes it up, then you yeah. use that. 
and that's what will turn them. So I'm, yeah. I'm excited for Antonia and I'm excited for women's history. Absolutely. And I want to say one last thing, because I, I always say uh, we want to also talk about Women's History Month. And I love that what Kamala Harris, VP and First Lady Jill, Jill Biden are doing about organizing the launch of the toll kit, about engaging and mobilizing women volunteers across the country. Because it's, you know, when women show up, we win. When our allies show up, when men show up, when democracy, people that love democracy show up, we win. But this is really great that they're organizing this. I think it's a great way to kind of start off with our first guest talking about when women show up, we do win. So let's look at how women are showing up in history with our next guest, uh, with Elizabeth Griffith, if we want to pull her up and I'll let you introduce her. Wonderful. Yeah. Hi, Betsy. I'm so excited Betsy. to get to talk with you today. And I, out of respect, what I want to say first is we have two women uh, who certainly are living uh, history for us. And that is uh, Miss Margaret Morrison, who's here. She was a child of Jim Crow. And we have a Georgia, Miss Georgia Fuller here, who was an ERA activist who was jailed and continues to fight today for women's rights. So you got two of them right here, but I'm excited today to talk about pink threads. I love it, but I think everybody here would be so curious to know how you came up with the name Pink Threads. Hello, everybody. I'm honored to be on today to celebrate women's history. And I'm, I'm, I'll answer that question, but you've um, so um, lifted us up with this inspiration about voting and acting that I'm going to start with this expression. Organize, agitate, educate, and vote. That's Susan B. Anthony. Most of women's history was a fight by black and white women to get the right to vote, and they wanted the right to vote so they could be change agents, and there's still a lot we need to change. So Pink Threads is, a, is an opportunity one, three or four times a month to offer people a snippet of women's history, because I think um, we still don't know enough, and I think American history needs to be as inclusive as possible, and, and women um, represent all the diversity of our country, and there are so many of them who can inspire us. Uh, a woman like Rosanelle Eaton. Rosanelle Eaton graduated from high school when high school wasn't open to Blacks in the South in the first half of the 19th century. So it took her until she was in her early 30s to earn her high school degree. And then valedictorian of her class, she marches off to register to vote in 1942 and is asked to recite the preamble of the Constitution in the discriminatory literacy tests that were given to Black people. Um, and she recites it with ease. She knew it. And they were so dumbfounded, they couldn't figure out what to do. So they came up, they raised the poll tax so that she couldn't vote then. But she joined the Shelby v. Holder case um, for expanding voter rights as uh, the Supreme Court has been limiting them and state legislatures have been limiting them when she was almost 100 years old. So we have in women's history so many examples of these courageous women who never gave up. So we can't give up either. So it's a reason to read Pink Threads. Pink, because of female, although it wasn't always only associated uh, stereotypically with women. Um, lots of men wore it in earlier centuries because it's dashing. Uh, and Threads, it's sort of a play on, again, stereotypes about women, that, mm -hmm. that we were the people who knit together communities. We spun the wool. We harvested the cotton under harsh enslaved conditions. There are lots of metaphors related to both pink and thread. And if you read one of my snippets that you can push on the button that says pink threads and it will explain more to you. Yes, I did push on the button and, uh, and because it's so interesting and we won't talk about it here because there's so many other things to talk about, but you do go through how pink was sort of like feminine and it's just sort of weak, but we sort of taken that back now. So we sort of own that color pink and we stand up to it. But as you are, you're writing these stories and it's about these women, you also talk about the fact what you just said that so many women we don't know about. But if you were to think about through all of the writing that you've done, women that were sort of in this moment, what do you think that they would be doing and saying that might be different from what we're doing and saying today? Well, I think they'd be nagging us to keep at it. They'd be so proud of the people who are participating in um, the leadership of this program and who are listening to this program, who are in the grassroots because I just am stunned by the moral courage 
of generations of women who kept at it. There are, you know, my book is formidable, is filled with the names of women, as is today's post about women's history. But there are going to be lots of names that we will never know. We will never know women who struck at the Lowell um, textile mills in the 1830s. There's a on the road on the highway between Selma and Montgomery, the National Park Service has put little historic signs along the way. And one of them informs you that women who marched over those the 90 miles, the three days, had in their purses toothbrushes and toilet paper because they did not know how the day was going to end. Would they be in jail? And so women like that, whose names we don't know, were certainly part of the surge to get the Voting Rights Act passed. So everybody needs to be in this fight. We cannot give it up. And as we see, we're clearly under threat for lots of our rights, voting rights, reproductive rights, all kinds of issues, as well as broader rights like climate change and gun control we need to address. So one of the, that is absolutely right. One of the things that I was, that I thought was, um, I thought it was really brave is sometimes we're afraid to jump out there because we're like, I don't know how to do this. I don't know how to do that. But when I was going through all of your pink threads, you were like, well, I'll take suggestions for this. I'll take suggestions <laughs> for that. This is my first time doing this. So I'm going to try that. So what would you say to anybody for any of the work that we're doing who you're, you're thinking, well, I just don't have it all together. It can't be perfect. But to just sort of go for it. What would you say to us to say, go for it? Well, as any good legislator knows, um, the perfect is the um, enemy of what's passable. We need to be able to get things done if that requires compromise or a, a less than perfect effort. Women too long have held themselves to a standard that unless we're exactly whatever we're told to be, um, we aren't good enough. Women are clearly good enough, and that applies to every single woman, gender, age, complexion, all the diversity that enriches our country. Um, I mean, I have I have a PhD in American history. I believe I've earned a second PhD in African American history writing my most recent book, and I am learning every day. And I frequently learn from readers who respond to me. I imagine I'll learn from the chat room um, today. Uh, so I, I suggest staying open to um, open to learning, open to improvement, but but keep your eye on the longer goal. There's a lot going on in our country that we and, and the wider world that we need to be um, committing ourselves to, to helping fix. You're right. Betsy, thank you. We are in it for the long game. I'm so delighted that you're going to stay in the after chat with us for a while, but this has been wonderful. I hope everyone will sign up for Pink Threads because you need that dose every single day. So we'll see you in the after chat. Thank you so much. Thank you. So now we'll go, keep moving with the show and we're going to bring up Antonius Gatton so that we can actually get a little bit of advice, a little bit of uh, energy uh, additionally around how we're going to talk to people, how we're going to be the messenger. So Antonia, there's been a lot going on. And so you and I are going to talk a bit about all that's going on. So let's begin to chat. And you've done some real interesting work around and you actually in the in the green room, we were having conversations today about you know, how to respond back to some of the um, challenges and some of the things that we're hearing. So let's get started. Okay. Thanks for having me on today. Um, it's always a pleasure to see you all. Um, what? How, how do you want to start? What do we want so to start? Let's, so let's, let's start here. So I, I know that everybody's been talking lately about um, is we are the messengers. Uh, hmm. No one's coming to save us. And so now that we we already knew that, so now we have to think about how are we going to start these conversations with people? And you have some ideas. So bring up the first slide, Dennis, so that we can sort of get a feel for how you've been thinking about how all of this stuff happens and then how it, in the end, it gets to us in terms of what we actually get to say to the people around us and how it works. Okay. Um, I've been kind of preaching this model for quite some time. Um because if you look at all the research on how communication really works and and how people are persuaded, um, we would do can we should do campaigns very differently than we do them now. Like right now, the campaign, you know, kind of tries to identify swing voters and and contacts them directly, and they're not a credible messenger. They're just not. And then if you look at the research in in marketing and and psychology. That's not how people are persuaded. It's really not. So if you were to change how we do campaigns, the campaign 
would focus on figuring out what is our mess, what is our positive message? What do we want people telling people over the fence, you know, telling their neighbors over the fence? And then we use the channels of communication that we have, whether that's our social media, our advertising, to get those talking points to our supporters. Because those supporters, which are you, they're the rank and file, the volunteers, the, the, the people in neighborhoods, you are the only credible, you are the only trusted messengers. So then you, in, in real life conversations, are the people who are going to get that message to the swing voters. And that means those messages have to be, um, they can't be a pile of statistics. They have to be something that you could comfortably say to a person. Um, they have to be positive because positive, all the data says positive is the only thing that works. And they have to be emotional. They have to be, they have to have feeling in them. But what, what we've learned about what makes advertising and marketing work is that it's not just, first of all, it's that personal conversation that you have, but then you have to have visibility to remind people to have more of those conversations. So when you see somebody with a hat or you get a postcard or you see a lawn sign or a billboard, you turn to the person next to you, you go, oh, I heard this thing, blah, blah, blah. It's so, so go tell, get it, get it. conversations. So Dennis, do the next slide because I think that's perfect yeah. for what you're saying in terms of visibility. So here we go. Yeah. So, let's, so let's just repeat that about what you say with the yard signs and the hats and the stickers and yeah. all that. Well, I'll just, yeah, I'll just run through this real quick. I mean, so, so, um, you know, this idea that one person, um, that nine out of 10 people make their decisions based on the recommendation of one person and you, political activists are that one person. So you are the people, you know, you are the secret weapon of word of mouth campaigning. You, you are the, me you are the messenger. Um, go ahead and pop to the next one, if you would. And so um, we need to increase opportunities for direct outreach. Face-to-face -face is the most effective thing. Door knocking is great, but, but the, more, the more social the environment, the more effective you can be in terms of approaching somebody as a peer, as a friend, as a neighbor. Um, that's really, so, so we should focus our campaigns on like, how many different ways can we get people together in person? Mm -hmm. um, and let's pop to the next one. And yeah, the I think people don't realize how important visibility is, but there, but the marketing, the data about marketing and the research really shows that if you don't have visuals in the environment, the word of mouth dies out. Like there's a reason why you see Coca-Cola cans with branding on them and billboards and all that. It's because it keeps those conversations going. So everything we do to put an image out there is actually playing a really critical role in keeping those conversations alive and, and reminding people to say things so the giving you an opportunity to bring something up that you might not have otherwise had the opportunity to say. I, I will say to you, Antonia, when I am driving and I see someone with a Biden-Harris or some type of Democratic uh, something on their car or in the window, mm -hmm. I feel really good. <laughs> I'm like, oh, geez, yeah. I'm not by myself. And so I, I think it does that too. So I think the hats, any of the yep. merchandise that talks about democracy, talks about the stories that 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 we're trying to tell and sell because it's true, you're saying that's critically imp important. Oh, it is. And I think, um, you know, like I have argued with people for decades about lawn signs, but like, you know, people always say, oh, they don't do anything. Well, you know what? They provide name recognition. They create the perception of viability which is critical in campaigns. People always like kind of go with the bandwagon. They um, they show peer endorsement by letting you know that neighbors, people like you are supporting the campaign. They drive web search traffic and they cue uh, word of mouth conversations. So five reasons at least why visual hats, especially for hats, t-shirts, bumper stickers, things that show that somebody says, I'm supporting this person. So that's just, I, I think it's absolutely critical. So we had one more slide that was the end slide, which we could do in the next 60 seconds. If Dennis mm -hmm. has it, we can put it up. But it was just the final slide on engagement. And it was just uh, you talking to us about uh, how important it is to do these things. So you want to just wrap up with that? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so I was just 
uh, reading today, there's a, a new report out from the Analyst Institute about um, direct mail and digital ads, and it was negative ads and contrast ads, and they just said they're not working. Like positive, there's just so much evidence out there that positive is is the thing that works. And it's, you know, that's exactly what you do. So we need to get everybody on message. We need to, I mean, don't rely on TV ads. They just don't really do anything. Focus on the ground game. Value your supporters. The campaigns need to understand how valuable you are in that process. They should be giving you giving you the talking points that you need to get out there and talk to your neighbors. And they need to provide visuals and the, the tchotchke and the chum and the, all of that stuff to keep those conversations going. And I'm going to just want to do one little thing. I'm always talking about this. Everybody wants to say, oh, my God, we have to say what uh, talk about what Trump just did or what Trump just said and all of that stuff. So um, I am I am going to quote Miss Taylor Swift and say, uh, <laughs> you got to remember, trash takes itself out every time. <laughs> you know, we, don't, we, can't, we don't have to go to we don't have to defeat our opponents. They are self-defeating. We need to get out there and be the positive, be the positive. We're, we're going to do that, Antonia. Thank you so much. I don't know if you'll be able to hang around in the after chat or not, but I know that yeah. folks have lots to say, and maybe we can do a little role play, which will be cool, too. So, Catherine, yeah. I'm going to bring it back to you. And yeah, thank I, you so much. I love it. I love it. Thank you, Fennell, for that. I, it's so good. And I have to say, I am all about swag, and we love to get our message out, so we will work on it. It's up to us, and our democracy looks good on you, Cam. That's right. And it looks good on us when we wear it. So thank you. And speaking of that, let's bring up our next guest. I'm so excited to welcome Kate Bassett, political director of Courier News. Sorry about that. How are you doing, Kate? Oh, I'm great. I mean, anytime I get to come into a Zoom that starts with a Stevie Nicks music video, I this is going to be my new normal. I think I I'm going to rule at our office. No more Zooms unless no we get to start you with the dance party. You guys are the best. Um, I'm so excited to be here and thank you for having me. And I'm I'm so happy to to be following that last segment because Antonio is brilliant and also because um, you know, I think that this segue is really great into the kind of work that we do at Courier Newsroom. Um, and I can just, do you want me to give like a very I'm quick- into it, I love it, please. Perfect, quick overview. Uh, we are currently in 10 states, um, soon to be 11. We are launching in Texas uh, this month, um, including Virginia, which was one of our original newsrooms, Dogwood. Um, and we really are a pro-democracy uh, news organization, the largest and fastest growing in the country, which I would like to say is a huge bragging right, but those of you who understand the state of local news know that that is really more about the um, trauma happening in the ecosystem than just us. But we are about 2.3 million subscribers strong. We have about 100,000 subscribers in Virginia at Dogwood, which is great. Um, and we were founded based kind of exactly on what you were just listening to, this understanding. Um, Tara McGowan, who is a, a long time, um, she was an Obama staffer, and she's a Democratic operative that uh, was running a digital agency in 2016 and saw what was happening with um, online news organizations really flooding the zone with that same message over and over and over. And it was taking over and traditional advertising wasn't cutting through. So she really wanted to build kind of an always on pro-democracy news space online to meet people where they are. And, and so most of the Americans that we're talking to are not folks like all of you on the call. They are people who are never paying a paywall, people who have been kind of left behind when their local weeklies or dailies have either closed or been bought by conglomerates. Um, and folks that I'm sure everybody here knows in the grocery store who will tell you something that you're like, whoa, that is crazy. Where did you get that? And you will ask maybe because you are all good citizens. Like, I'm so curious. Tell me more. Like, where did you hear that? And they will inevitably say, oh, geez, I don't know. But it was a news story I saw on Facebook when I was scrolling. And I think, um, you know, in, in I'm, I'm going to keep giving you shout outs, Antonio, but in Reclaiming America, yeah. I think that um, there has been this really great 
you know, push. Uh, you just wrote a, a post, I think maybe your most recent one, about repeated exposure. And so that is really a thing that sets us a little bit apart from other pro-democracy news organizations in general. We really do believe that that is the way that you move the needle and fight disinformation. It's with repeated exposure of the storylines and the issues that connect the dots between policy, policymaker, and everyday impact. Um, and we do so in the spaces like social media, where people are with trusted messengers, which means we don't just rely on our journalists who are wonderful press award winning folks. Um, we also reach into our states and find state based influencers and content creators who have relational audiences of their own and then we have them break down our news in in vertical video forms on our social platforms so that we can build that connection for people both um, in their own audiences and to give people a face and a name that they can trust on our audiences. I love that because you're really I talk so much at you. I'm so no, sorry. I, I, I get so excited about this. Okay. Stuff. This is people don't want to hear from me they want to hear from you and that's I let it roll because all everything all the questions I had for you you're answering because I was really curious I knew a little bit we know Tara she is awesome and uh, and you know the Midas touch folks very similar and you know you see them now breaking through that noise with millions and millions of viewers and getting out the content they were frustrated too and like you it is so important to really break through that. So it, it, let's talk a little bit more in depth about how you do break through and get that message out. I mean, you described it, but what does that really look like? And how do you choose the stories? I'm assuming maybe you're looking into, let's say rural communities or, so are you putting it like in the AM spaces or the local newspapers? How are you really kind of getting at this to get in front of the people that really need to hear it? That's a great question. So a couple of different things. Um, one, just like you saw in the slides um, before I came on, that sort of concept of building surround sound narratives and really deepening um, the, the way to connect. We work really closely with organizations um, on the ground in the last election cycle in Virginia. We were um, working very, very closely with the team, the, the communications team at Freedom Virginia, for example, for some really okay. hyper-local stuff. So we really dig in and all talk about kind of like, what are the messages that are working? What is resonating? What is going to drive civic engagement, because that's really what we're here to do. Um, so, so we talk about that. We build out stories and news and headlines. We actually test our headlines um, oftentimes to see what's resonating and to make sure that, that the people that we want to be connecting yeah. with are following along and engaging. And then we distribute in, in multiple different ways. So one of the ways we do this is by boosted news. So um, because we are a news organization that understands that in the very decentralized uh, algorithm driven world of social media that uh, the wonderful age old adage of um, if you tell things, stories that are relevant and essential, your readers will find them is yeah. not true. Okay, uh, not true. You, okay. you have to, you have to, you have to push a little bit on that. So we will think about stories if we're telling rural stories. Um, and, and again, we get all of this from like working very closely with on the ground partners who are doing deep canvassing work, who are having the conversations in their communities, who are tracking very closely the policies that are really driving engagement. And then we may boost directly to those communities so that we know that people are going to be able to see this news. And this is what we do. You know, I want to be really clear. We have um, true blue journalists who who are members of their state press associations. They win awards. They they don't play both sides in our in our network because we don't believe in that. But but they do tell factual content that then we, we can then lift up to the social media world. Um, on platforms like Meta, on platforms like Snapchat, on platforms like TikTok, so that we can ensure we see it. But then we also do a whole bunch of organic tactics, um, which is where, you know, wonderful folks like you all come in. Uh, I come from an OG organizing background, so I love me some <laughs> postcards. Right. I talk about digital postcarding uh, in my current role. Uh, we have a really great organizing team that will connect with individuals and groups and small groups that will train people on how to stop the spread of disinformation online by how to interact with media content that is not factual versus how to interact with media content that is factual. And then really, you know, we do talk about this as digital postcarding, lifting up and sharing 
some good quality information. I think that oftentimes news hits a little differently. So it feels a little bit safer for people who are just getting in the kind of online space of having those conversations. Um, and then we also, again, leverage networks of content creators and influencers that can take our headlines as source material, green screen backgrounds. We work with artists who use our, our content to make you know, gifts and memes. Um, and then we we also work with organizations. Um, we don't have one right now in Virginia, but here's a call to action if anyone knows folks working on this. Uh, like in North Carolina, we have a, a partner organization that does a lot of work to seed news into uh, local weeklies and also onto radio shows. So when we build out content, then we can... Um, that additive, yep, we can have additive spaces on the radio. We can provide content for free because we're open source to local weeklies who are usually hungry for information really? use because they have small and you know increasingly smaller staffs. Um, and so we really try to bridge bridge those gaps in yep. any space we can. No, that is excellent. I mean, um, so for the national election, what are you what are you guys thinking of? I mean, what do you see the news now and the kind of stuff we are talking about? I'm curious. I mean, I play this game. I this is a game I play. I before I turn on the TV, I go, how long will it be till I hear the word Trump? <laughs> and it's like MSNBC is the worst. I, I turn it on and, and within 30 seconds I hear I hear that. That's all they're talking about. But that's not really what we want people to be seeing, right? Like and elevating yet the me, the regular media, honest to God. It drives me nuts because I'm like, why aren't you showing IVF women suffering? Why, you know, showing what's really happening. Why aren't you showing this, what's really going on in people's community they're concerned about? And I know these things are important, but it's like 30 seconds and it's saying this damn word. And he loves being in the news. Yeah. So I want, you know, so let's look at this national election. How do we really control the narrative or really make sure that we're in this space and people are hearing it? What's yeah, your that's that's a great, that's a great question. I wish I had a magic wand to Me too. Uh, put all of us in charge because we oh, have a better Here's job. Than, magic wand. Let's do it. And what's okay. happening. Yeah. I love it. Oh my gosh. That's so great. Um, okay, go yeah. You know, I think actually a really great proof point um, that we're leveraging across our network is from our work um, in collaboration with the Freedom Virginia team um, in last cycle, because we did a lot of economic focused stories and really tried to connect the dots between what was happening in the, you know, administration, the implementation of all of the great work that the administration had done and how that really impacts local communities. And then understanding how to add on to that to really celebrate and honor local, hyper-local, you know, mm -hmm. I know we did this in Hampton Roads and Virginia Beach in particular, issues and leaders that are like following along those lines, right? Whether it's American Rescue Plan Act funds right. Or it's it's um, a conversation about infrastructure uh, uh, and understanding federal you know support for state based infrastructure, but then also following up with stories about you know like local sidewalk expansion because that matters and really yeah. helping people right. connect the dots um, between right here at home. And I think you know so right that having the opportunity to balance like the hard and scary, obviously reproductive rights yeah. and acts and healthcare access for women um is gonna is top of mind for all of us this cycle but also um i think i know you all feel like this like 2016 feels like a really long time ago and people are tired and they're tired of being scared and they're tired of being yes. angry and so giving them opportunities to remember like what we're fighting for not it's just really fighting important. against yes is really 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 important so we work really hard in all of our state newsrooms to lift up those localized humanized oh, story. stories of how government can work and function and help and make a difference. Yeah, well, good. And I'm so glad. And in the chat, I think we have people that are stepping up and are taking your, uh, I think somebody from the union, Carlton, somebody, if you look in the message, write it again, they give you your phone number, give your contact information. So I think, I know the union works in Virginia. They're a great support. Thank you, Kate. And I, I love it. Let's stay in, in touch. And we definitely need to make sure we're getting the news out. Thank you so much. Yes, uh, thank I you. so much. What, how, that was super great. And I know our next, ses, uh, next segment is with Congressman Conley. Can we bring him up? I saw him in the room a dozen times. Hey, there he is. You look like you're home. You look like you're home. Are you home? I, Are you home, sir? I am. 
Oh, good. Well, get comfortable. Are you comfortable? Because we want to really dish with you. We know you, what the heck. This is Congressman Jerry Conley. For those in the uh, the room, we're so uh, excited. So it sounds like they got you out of the hill in your home. Uh, yeah, we were supposed to be in session and they canceled it because we passed the short term funding gap measure yesterday. So um, oh, yeah. I am free to talk to you. Oh, good. Well, we can dish up because there's so much to talk about. You know, I let's just start. OK, you just so what the low, the most current news is that you passed something to get to fund the government until what, September? No, um, we passed a two part bill. Right. So okay. that expires. The first part expires on March 8th. But we do have a bill ready to go that's agreed to to fund that part through September. And so we will pass that next week. The second part, which is the largest part and includes defense and homeland security, is expires on March 22nd. And we do yeah. not yet have agreement on that. So we have to watch that for. Yes. Well, I saw that and I, I was enjoying a tweet by you. I just was reading it that you had a gentle note to House Republicans that you work for the American people, not Vladimir Putin. <laughs> and to pass this damn bipartisan national security bill. So I'm assuming this money, we're still in this fight. And I know you just came back from NATO working on this and you had been. I, I want you to tell the room your story. I found it so moving when I bumped into you uh, that you were with now the widow of Navalny. Um, and so let's talk about your visit and what what you saw there. What's really what's going on with Ukraine and just update us on this national news. Right. So so there was a, a delegation, a, a big House delegation that included Nancy Pelosi and Hakeem Jeffries, the Democratic leader, uh, as well as the ranking members of intelligence and armed services and foreign affairs. Uh, and the chairman, the Republican chairman of the Intelligence Committee, who's a big supporter of Ukraine, uh, Mike Turner of Ohio. And so we, he and I led this big delegation uh, to the Munich Security Conference, where Kamala Harris spoke, mm -hmm. and to the uh, NATO Parliamentary Assembly first annual meeting, uh, which is always in Brussels, uh, Belgium. And uh, when we were there, we got the news that Alexei Navalny uh, had died. Mm. And it turned out that his widow was at the Munich Security Conference. So she was a surprise guest and she had the poise and self-possession to be able to speak, which was amazing because she had just learned her husband had died that morning. Mm. We, the U.S. delegation, met with her privately later that day. And... It was very moving, um, you know, and she talked about the fact that she was going to carry on the work of her husband uh, and that she wasn't going to give up and that sooner or later, someday, Russia was going to be a free country again, free of Vladimir Putin and free, free of authoritarian, you know, dictatorial oh, yes. that are in place. Um, she is an extraordinary person. Uh, her composure was amazing. Uh, you mm. could tell she was holding back a lot right. of emotion in order to speak to people, to remind them what Alexei stood for and what the stakes are. Um, and, uh, yeah, I, and nobody was was not un, you know untouched by it. Right. Um, and, and at one point, Nancy Pelosi even said, I think we need to have a prayer uh, in memory of Alexei. Uh, with Yulia being there. And uh, there were 18 House members, plus staff and others in the room. And uh, everyone was saying, well, who, who's going to lead us in prayer? And right. finally, finally, they all said, well, Jerry. So I led, the Irish I led, guy. <laughs> I, yeah. I, so I led us in prayer. And when it was all finished, uh, Nancy said to me privately, like, who knew you were so spiritual? And I looked at her and her staff and I said, what does she think? She's the only Catholic in the room. <laughs> yeah, that's so funny. I know. But, and uh, I, but it was really a moving. Really moving. What I mean by that is, yes, you 
your passion comes into your work. You're a fighter. That's what I love about you, that Irish fighter that comes out. We need that right now more than ever because we are, you know, we talk about this now for several years from the minute we had uh, when we had you on when the insurrection happens happened you were on the show we've been in this battle today is about really using uh, being the messenger getting the word out talking to people and you're part of that you know you are at the elected level you have a great platform to really get the message out to your constituents to the world they're listening to you and i want to say that they appreciate it and this and i would like to say let's talk about ukraine and the importance of that what yeah. the hell, let me just say, let me channel my dead mother. What the <laughs> hell is going on with Republicans that are embracing Putin? What is going on with the Republican Party? Can we just start there right now? Because I yeah. just, it, I know we kind of know, but let's just really talk about it. So it is amazing. As you said, Catherine, I mean, here's the Cold War party. Right. This is the party of Ronald Reagan who talked about the Soviet Union being an evil empire. This is the party of Ronald Reagan going to the Berlin Wall saying, Mr. Gorbachev, tear down this wall. What happened to them? Now they're Putin enablers. Um, and it's all because of Donald Trump. Uh, they, they are so terrified of crossing him on anything. Right. They're willing to actually cede their long-term commitment to fighting uh, Russian and before that Soviet right. a and 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 assertiveness uh, to please uh, you know Donald Trump, who has a problem with Russia. I mean, you know, yeah, there is something very weird about Donald Trump and his connections with Putin and with Russian. Well, operatives. let me just take you one step backward. Like, let's just think about this. I remember years ago that the Republicans went to Russia. We saw Tucker Carlson going to Russia. We see Orban, Orban going to speak at CPAC. There is something deeper. I think maybe Trump is sort of like this bludgeon for them because he doesn't care about anything or democracy. He just cares about himself and grifting and money and power so they can use him. Uh, but I'm wondering what I see and the money in the NRA that had Russian money. Remember that it's like, yeah, if you didn't yeah. know, remember that. And then Ukraine, when we saw the money, those people went to jail. I mean, even the people around Trump that went to jail were, were playing with uh, that Russian money that was filtering through the campaigns. I can't, I'm just, you know, um, Manafort, I think there was a, a, this is something going on. And then our allies, um, I don't know if you've talked to the former Australian ambassador or prime minister that was on who said they're afraid America is going to have to be next in line to be taken over by dictators. So what do you say when you're in Europe to folks that are worried about America? I wish I could have given them reassurance. Mm. Uh, I had to couch everything I said in, we'll have to see. Uh, this is a, a absolutely critical election. Donald Trump cannot win. Um, we're going to fight tooth and nail for aid to Ukraine, but also more importantly for democracy, uh, you know, not only surviving, but hopefully flourishing here in the United States. Uh, if we can basically, you know, smite Donald Trump and his acolytes in this election, I think we have a, a it's a turning point, right? We, we yes. put this virus behind us. If if we don't, God help us. And I'm not even going to speculate on that because I am determined to make sure we win. Yes. Um, the stakes are so high. And I will say, you know, any one of us as Democrats or uh, with a big D or a small D can pick apart something we don't like with Joe Biden. Right. Every time, every time we do that, we are eroding the edifice we've built to counter Donald Trump. This is not the time to to be right. equivocal. This is not the time to be overly critical of Joe Biden. Right. Put, put it aside for now. He's our nominee. He's going to be our nominee, and we need him to win. And um, uh, and you know, I know Joe Biden. I worked for him for ten years. Uh, the man has mental acuity. Right. He is 81. He's slowed down physically. That's true. Um, but that doesn't mean he can't do the job. And the alternative is too horrifying to contemplate. So, you know, right. I'll take the I'll take the 81 year old yes. with the acuity he has over the orange headed monster. Right. Who is the alternative.
Well, yeah, no, no, it's true. It's sort of, we know where we are, like you said, and we're not dating, right? I mean, this is sort of like, we, we you know, we, we, we need to support the president. We know that we have BP Kamala Harris and, and, and First Lady Jill Biden going out on the road organizing women, because when we organize women, we win. We see yeah. these rulings that only get worse, uh, Congressman, for women. When we saw the fall of Roe, now we see IVF and, you know, Clarence Thomas warned us what was coming with Griswold. He was going to overturn contraception. We see that now in the Virginia Assembly. I don't know if you see some of the bills coming down. I think all but five Republicans voted for uh, people in, in Virginia to have access, legal access to contraception. So I think these are things we need to let people know that it's not, you know, we're not voting for a person. We're voting for a platform. Right. Democrats have a platform for the working people. They support women's rights. You know, there were, you know, again, no one is perfect, but man, we're looking good, is what I'm saying. We're looking good. You know, you're exactly right. And and you're right too, Catherine, especially when we look at reproductive rights. Yes. Exactly what we predicted after the Dobbs decision overturning Roe v. Wade has happened. Has happened. Uh, so so we see an Alabama Supreme Court invoking God. I know the theater. God infuses personhood at the moment of conception. So an embryo is the equivalent of a child. Now, I've, the irony of that ruling is that IVF is used by couples to have children. Right. Science, by making, the way. Yeah. And you're <laughs> making it harder for people who want to have families. Yes. And you're also threatening medical treatments where IVF has been a, a miracle uh, yeah. in terms of curing illnesses or managing them, saving lives. And Absolutely. what kind of pro-life movement is that? No, and um, they're, running, they're trying to run from it right now. And we, yeah, can, exactly. and it's really ridiculous because we could see them and the, uh, and like you said, the interjection of the biblical stuff to interpret law, the Supreme Court with the recent r ruling that you probably heard also that you, just yesterday, the news has never stopped yet about the Supreme Court now hearing the immunity case. What's your thoughts on that? And then we're going to wrap up. I know you have to go. So, I, you know, I think this is a very ultra right political Supreme Court. And the idea that Supreme Courts aren't political is nonsense. They've been political right. since they were created. You know, if Thomas Jefferson were still alive, he'd tell you all about how political John Marshall was. Right. Um, and um, and so they don't even hide their, their politics. And uh, clearly the decision to hear the immunity case is designed to delay yes. a criminal trial, a criminal trial, because they are trying to help Trump avoid uh, the possibility of being convicted in a criminal trial and being sentenced. Um, and so, uh, you know, uh, I, I think it's a terrible ruling. I think it's blatantly partisan and political to help Donald Trump. Uh, and I think it's going to set back the cause of justice in holding everybody accountable to the rules of law, including yeah. former president. It really is so, something, yeah. Clarence Thomas, whose wife, Jenny Thomas, was was texting Mark Meadows about the insurrection, and he still is up there. It's uh, unbelievable. I think it's a little frustrating when we have democracy lovers to see this. It's it's crazy. But I do want to give a plug to you. Your 30th annual FET for St. Patty's Day, March 17th, is coming up. And, you know, the holy day itself. The holy day right behind my in my uh, Nova Community College at Ernst Cultural Center. So everybody, I'll put the link, the link stair, if you can put the link in there. And, you know, um, your office is, is kindly said that Network Nova could have a table at the FET and we will just, you know, give out our great Women's Summit stuff. I already told Donald that I want you at the Women's Summit June 28th, Mark, and 29th, mark your calendar. We'll be out and loud and at the yeah. National Conference Center, God willing, as we say. Yeah. Yeah, I hope everyone can come to St. Patrick's Day. It's the biggest celebration in Northern Virginia and maybe the biggest in the state. We'll have a thousand people there. Uh, and you don't want to be missing. No, it's great. Uh, we'll, have a, we'll have a full dinner and we'll have live Irish music with Shepherd's Pie Band. Uh, yes. So it's a lot of fun. Oh, beer, a lot of beer, beer, beer. 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 A lot of beer. And, a lot of beer, uh, yes. And we'll have salmon for people who don't want meat. Um, and uh, it's a it's a great time. It's a great, it's a great time. Network and smooth and have fun. 
Yeah, so if you want to know how to get to Jerry's heart, you just have to roll up some cabbage and uh, corned beef. And I, I think I pushed up a, a couple, a hundreds of pounds of that for one, for one of them. So that's how I got in the room, folks. That's all you got to do. Send some corned beef. To the congressman. Okay, send him my love. Uh, be safe, my friend. Thank you for being here. And Fennell, here we go. Thanks. Happy St. Patrick's Day. Everybody get a ticket. For now, I love ending the show with Congressman Conley. All right, you got to unmute yourself, Messenger. You can't. Don't put baby in the corner. She had, unmute her. Okay. <laughs> We're seven minutes over, and uh, I want to say hello to Robin Warner out there who is traveling, and I know uh, she's having a good time. We miss her on the show, but but she needs a vacation too. So. Yeah, she does, and I think we had a great show today. So yes. I think we should just. Pulls her up and get right to the after chat. So let's do that. And I want to say thank you first. So it's always good to say thank you. And then we'll get to, I want to thank our guests for being here. How about an awesome show? Let's say hello and thank you. I mean, say thank you to Kate Bassett, political director of Courier News. I loved it. Elizabeth Griffith is going to be able to spend some time with it for about her pink threads. And Antonia Scanton is always going to be with us because she's going to continue talking about messaging in the after chat. And thank you to the team today. We couldn't do this without the team. And you can see them up there. I won't say all their names today, but you can watch it in the credits. Special thanks to Dennis Orsinger for really handling stuff today. And also Stephanie, um, Stephanie Davis is up there. Thank you so much. Next week, you don't want to miss it. Bold moves, people. Bold moves. Steve Phillips, Democracy uh, in Color is going to be here. The, he's the podcaster of Democracy in Color, founder of New Majority Index. Lauren Burke, founder of Black Virginia News. We're going to dish. We're going to dish about everything in the General Assembly. We were telling some gossipy stuff.